As you all know, I'm sure, uh, ospreys are fish-eating hawks. They're often called fish hawks or fish eagles even, occasionally. And they're very highly specialized on fish. They don't eat anything but fish. And they're one of, they're, they're sort of strangely, they're a strange raptor. They're extremely specialized to eat fish. But once, you're, once you get to the fish part, then they're not very specialized at all. So they're sort of a specialized generalist or a general, generalized um, generalized specialists or specialized generals. They dive down head first toward the water and at the last minute they swing their feet forward and they go in feet first. They can get into about about a yard under into the water. So the fish they, they catch have got to be up in the top meter or so of the water column. And these guys here are just, you don't have we don't have the audio, but they're trying to remember, do they go in head first or do they go in feet first? And these are just some Fishermen, and this is this is all shot in Long Island, and that one missed. They're pretty efficient, um, but and they're amazing that you know that when you look at something in the water, it isn't where it seems to be. There's that refraction thing. So somehow, young ospreys, when they're learning to hunt, somebody asked me in last night's lecture, how do parents ospreys teach their young to hunt? Now they don't. They simply provide the young with an allowance, basically. They keep feeding them while the young are out there following their own instinct. A mother duck doesn't teach its young to swim. She just takes it to the water, and the, and the ducklings learn to swim. Um, so one of the things that ospreys will do, they'll get the fish head first underneath them, so that it reduces the, the, wing speed, the wind resistance. My favorite part of this is the way they shake when they're coming out of the water. And that's what this little series is all about. They get pretty, they're obviously wet. <laughs> Can we uh, dim the lights? Does anyone know if there's a, oh, and then Sam, I'm gonna need you up here on the, um... okay. So this is great. There's one of these where you shake so hard that they lose feathers. So enough of that fun. So I sort of thought about the, um, I hadn't for, I'd forgotten about this, but the Gandalf and Strider, um, my addiction to the Tolkien Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, shows up here that there and back again is the subtitle to the Lord of the Rings. Um, and so we're talking about, we're focusing mostly tonight about osprey migration, which is there down to South America for most ospreys and back again. Uh, next. So there are lots of things that we can learn about migration. Prior to this invention of the technology we're using now with satellite telemetry, I've got a transmitter here at the end. I'll pass it around so you can see what they look like. Uh, prior to the invention of the satellite telemetry technology, what we knew about bird migration was all, almost always all based on band returns. So you can catch a bird, or band a bird in its nest and put a little aluminum band, a little bracelet around its leg. Each band has a unique number. So, and we record, once we've banded all our birds for the season, we report to the bird banding lab in Patuxent, Maryland, give them all the information about each band number, what the species was, the age and the sex, and where we banded it and when we banded it. And then we just sit back and wait for someone to find that bird. And usually when a bird is found, especially with the large birds of prey, it's almost always because they're dead. So you sort of want to see your birds get re banned returns, but on the other hand, you, that means your bird is dead usually. So, but that tells us a lot of things about a bird. It tells us we know where it started, and we have, a, we have a point A and a point B. But we don't have how did that bird get, what was the route it took to get from point A to point B. We don't know when it left point A. We don't know at point B if that's where it was going to, if this is down in South America, let's say, for an osprey. We don't know if that was where that bird was spending its winter or if it was only partway on its migration. So there's a lot we can tell from migration, from the banding data, but there's a lot we can't. And the things we can, now that we've got the satellite telemetry information, is we can tell the timing of the migration. We know when they start migration. We know if they stop for a while on the way south. Do they, do they have stopover periods going south, more so than on the return trip in the spring? Um, are there differences in age and sex between the routes they go? And this, we'll find out the answer to that is big time yes. 
we can start to figure out a bit about mortality. With almost all of the banding returns, the bird's either been shot or has run into a car or, or been injured somehow. And all of those are going to be by definition on land. So we get a bias from those banding returns. If you look at all of the band returns from ospreys in South America, there's a big concentration up in Colombia in the Medellin and the Magdalena River valleys. And that's because, so it looks like that's where most ospreys spend, spend the winter. But what that really tells us is that's where the most people are. And so that's where ospreys are most often running into people and enough of those encounters with people are fatal for the ospreys that we get a band return. But when we look at the, bat, the data of where our ospreys with satellite tags are going, we see that they're spread out very evenly across most of the north half of South America. We can begin to get some clues about how birds navigate. This is one of the great mysteries of, nav of animal migration, is how does an osprey leaving Martha's Vineyard find its way 4,000 miles down the coast of the U.S., over the Caribbean, to a little section of the Rio Madeira in southern Amazonia in Brazil, and then turn around and come back, and then the next year do it, this, repeat the same process. Because one of the th another thing we, we know from the satellite work that we can't tell from bands is that birds go back to the same spot every winter. They got the exact same ponds, and they're, sometimes they're flying 4,000 miles their whole migratory route. And the information gives us a few clues about uh, conservation that we'll get to. So next, so here's my study site. Come on. <laughs> um, next. So um, that's what the transmitters look like. It's a little, uh, it weighs about an ounce, and an osprey weighs, female osprey weighs about four pounds, a male about three pounds. So there's a rule of thumb that we can't put anything on a bird that weighs more than 3% of the bird's body weight. And this is only an ounce on a four pound bird, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. There's about a six inch antenna that sticks up. So that little rate, and there's a solar panel, that black panel there is a solar panel that keeps the battery charged. We have right now, we have uh, two birds that have been transmitting for four years. Um, Transmitters are expensive, they cost $4,000 each. We put them on, uh, so they're in my little backpack in the next slide. We, there are four, two straps come over the wings and two straps come under the wings. Where, they, where those four straps cross on the breast, I stitch them together. And what you see there is a little cardboard template that holds the straps in place for me. And, it, and I can adjust the tension just right. Uh, and then I stitch the straps together and then all of that is cut away. And so um, that all comes. The bird doesn't leap with that one, it heads south. Next. So some nests are harder to get to than others. Um, I like the one on the left. <laughs> the one on the right has a 20 foot ladder. <laughs> and then I had to use my spurs to go the next 20 feet. Well, I just went, right after this picture was taken, the rope on my belt slipped off. I didn't tie a good knot. So I had to go back down to the ladder. Someone walked the rope up to me. I went back up to the nest only to discover that the young had already left. And so I was not in a good mood on the drive home after that adventure or misadventure. Next. So how do we catch the birds? Here's the answer to the question from dinner. Uh, we put a cage of some sort over the nest. And with adults, we do it while they're on eggs. And the, the cage is covered with little slip knots tied out of fishing line. And it's sort of like the Chinese finger tricks. The tighter you pull, the more you pull, the tighter it gets. Well, the same thing happens. The ospreys want to get back on their eggs. They walk along that little trap, and they get their toes into the nooses. And when they pull their foot back, the noose tightens up on their toe, and they can't get away. Next. For the young birds, we use uh, take fish. So I've, in my, that plastic bag, I've got a couple of menhaden, which ospreys love. It's their favorite food. And I've got a piece of wire there. It's just a piece of two by two sort of galvanized chicken wire with rubber coated. And that's all covered with a little slip knots. Next. So we put the fish in the nest and then tie that noose carpet over the, over the fish. And the young come back to get, because they want to get the fish. And they get caught in the um, trap. And they get, it. instead of the fish, they get a radio transmitter. Next. So when I get to the nest, we put a hood on the bird's heads. And that calms them right down. Occasionally, we get two birds, and when I get and the ospreys have about a five-foot wingspan, so when you get up to the top, back into the nest, and there are two ospreys flat flailing around 
Um, it can get pretty chaotic, and putting the hoods on the birds' heads really helps. Last year in New Hampshire, we, were, we had one transmitter to put on a young bird at a nest where there were three young. And we had, the year before, we had tagged the adult bird at that nest. That bird was named Art. And we really wanted to get Art's transmitter back because he had flown to Brazil and back and we didn't need for him to carry that transmitter anymore. So we thought in sort of the best case scenario, with three young, I knew I would catch one of them. And we thought, well, maybe we'll get lucky and catch Art. And if we catch Art, we'll take his radio off. And then we'll try to catch another young, and we could put Art's radio on one of his offspring. So we set up the trap, and about 15 minutes later, there were three young flying around the nest, all hungry as could be. And about 15 minutes after we set up, Art came in with a great big trout. And as he flew toward the nest, one of the young saw Dad coming in with the fish, and he wanted to be first in the nest. So he flew right up to the nest, and I think he was looking back at Dad when he landed, because he didn't even see the trap. And then, so he landed, and then Art came in with his fish, and he was tired of carrying that big trap, so he just plopped down on the nest and trap. And then one of the other young wanted to, didn't want to miss out on breakfast, so he flew in, and within about five minutes, we had all three of them trapped in the nest. <coughs> and that was really chaotic. So I went, I went, and this was a little bucket truck affair. Um, and we wound up about 25 minutes after setting the trap, walking away with three ospreys under our arms. And we took Art's transmitter off, and we gave it to one of his young male offspring, whom we, someone said, well, it's called Art Jr. I said, no, how about R2? <laughs> so, so Art 2 is, is now down on the Amazon River after successfully migrating south this uh, last fall. Next. So these are areas where uh, ber birds have been tagged. I didn't tag at all these locations, but this is all the places where ospreys have been tagged as of two years ago. Um, someone may ask about hacked, what are hacked juveniles. Hacking is the process where you release, take young birds that were born someplace, and you release them, at, in the case of ospreys, at a, a new reservoir where you want to get an osprey population built up. That one of the things about ospreys is males very rarely nest more than about 15 miles from where they were born. Females wander, males don't. And that's nature's way of keeping the gene pool mixed up. And mo most animals have that kind of an arrangement where one sex goes far from home and the other doesn't. And that, the fancy term for that is phylopatry, where they, they like being where they were born. So what that means in ospreys is if you've got a new reservoir that you think would be great osprey habitat, if it's more than about 20 or 30 miles from some place where ospreys are nesting, female ospreys are going to find that reservoir, but it's really unlikely that males will. So if you want to get ospreys set up there, take a bunch of babies from some place where there, there's a big osprey colony and they're cranking out a lot of young and they can spare a few. You take them up to your new reservoir and you release them, put them in a big cage that has bars, looks like a jail cell. You let them grow up there and then when they're ready to fly, you open the doors of their little cell and they begin to explore around that reservoir and you keep feeding them sort of a little trap door in the back that provides fish. So those birds imprint on that area. And when those young males migrate south, if they make it through the migration, they'll come back to that lake. So that's what hacking means. Next. So here are where, those are the routes, very generally speaking, that ospreys from those different areas take. The Pacific Northwest birds mostly winter in Mexico and Central America. Very few make it all the way to South America. Midwest birds, some of them, all of the East Coast birds go down the coast to, to Florida, to Cuba, to Hispaniola, and then down to South America. 90% of the ospreys in the East Coast winter in uh, South America. A few winter in Cuba. Very few in the islands, but a few. Very few do. Um, that, the line out over the Atlantic, we're going to more on that later. The Midwest birds, some of them join the East Coast flyway. The, we call it the highway to the tropics, Florida, Cuba, Hispaniola. Some of them go straight across the Gulf. They go down the Mississippi flyway and then across the Gulf. And some go um, west of the Gulf of Mexico, staying over land the whole way. Funny thing about ospreys, they're fish-eating birds, so they need water, but they don't really want to fly over long bodies of water. They avoid that if at all possible. And that's because an osprey can't land in the water and rest like a duck or a gull. So if an osprey's out over open water and they fly into really bad weather, they could be in serious trouble. And more on that later. next. So, um, 
I'm going to skip over the next two. These were, I just gave this talk three times in Rhode Island. Go ahead on the next, and next, and next. Okay, now those were in for the Rhode Island audience down in Jamestown. Um, but we're going to, all, all of that information will be in future slides anyway. So, how do birds find their way from point A to point B? Well, one way you might expect them to do it, which would be the way we would find our way from point A to point B, as long, assuming we don't have our GPS navigator turned on, is you go by landmarks. You have a route memorized. So to get home, you know that you go to one intersection, you take a right, you go to the next intersection, take a left, and you find your way home by a, a memorized route of land, following landmarks. Well, ospreys clearly don't do that. Here is the track of, two, of one bird, North Fork Bob, banded on the North Fork of Long Island. Uh, in 2010, he flew down the coast overland. When he came out of New York, uh, the wind in 2010, that particular day, was out of the east. And ospreys, when they're heading south, they just go with the flow. They, they know exactly where they're going to go, but it does, they don't have to follow the same route every year. So if the wind's out of the east, they drift west. They go with the flow. And, this, and they'll often go west of, it, of Delaware and Chesapeake Bays, right over D.C., down the coast, and down to Florida, and then on. If, so in the next year, in 2011, when Bob was coming out of New, over New York City, the wind was out of the west, and so he went with the flow, and, he, and it pushed him all the way to the Jersey Beach, the coast, and he went down the coast, and then went over Cape May, and followed his way down to the Outer Banks, where there are a bunch of peninsulas in the Outer Banks. The rule in osprey migration that they follow is basically go south and stay over land if at all possible. And if you can't stay over land because you've run into a peninsula, then you just go over water. So a lot of the, may, the adults when they get to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, we'll do it, that's about a 500 mile trip over the Georgia Bight from the Outer Banks to the eastern coast of, short coast of Florida. Next. So here is, uh, this is Bob again. And here we see in fall of 2010, which was the first year we had followed his migration. So, and he was tagged as an adult, so we don't know how many years he'd done this before or what path he took before. But in 2010, you see the green line out to the east uh, as he was coming off of Hispaniola, uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And he was, uh, the wind was obviously out of the east, out of the west rather, and blew him east. So he landed in Venezuela and found his way over the Andes. There's a ridge of the Andes that comes right up here. So he found his way over the Andes and down to his wintering spot on the Ventuari River in southern Venezuela. The green track in between the two extremes there is his spring track in, in spring of 2011. Then in fall 2011, he took a very different route across the Caribbean, presumably just because the wind was blowing in a different direction. And he landed in Colombia about 400 miles west of where he had hit South America the year before, but that was no big deal. He worked his way around uh, Lake Maracaibo, up over the Andes. There's a pass right here that we see a lot of the birds coming south, wind up going right, right where all those paths converge. And so around the lakes and down and right back to his spot. So again, they're not using landmarks. They may use landmarks when they get close, but they're zooming in using some sense of the Earth, with using the Earth's magnetic field in some way that we don't very clearly understand. Next. So we're going to compare juveniles and adults here. Now, the juvenile ospreys you can recognize because they have sort of speckling on their back. So the two birds in the middle are the young birds. Mom is feeding. The adults are solid black on the back. It's really a deep chocolate brown, but it looks pretty really black. Um, males are pretty much white, pure white on the breast, so if you want to know how, people often ask, how do you tell a male osprey from a female? And males typically are really light on the front, their chest and belly. Females often have a dark chest band. Well, there's a little overlap on that, so it's not all rely always reliable, but it's, it's pretty, uh, works pretty well. So the speckled birds are the youngsters, and we're going to compare the tracks of juveniles with adults in the next couple of slides. Ed? So here are the adult paths. 
And you see that there's a real pattern. Most of them go down the coast. They almost all go to Florida. There are a couple of oddballs that went, took a right when they got to Cuba and went over to the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America. More on those in a second. But you see that most of them do Florida, Cuba, Hispaniola, and then you see that main sort of waterfall of birds coming off Hispaniola. What you can't see in that because of the, both the scale and, and the number of paths, tracks that are going off that point is that that's right in the middle of Hispaniola. So a couple of them keep going and go the farthest to the right there, that bird actually made it to the Virgin Islands. The next one over from the far, farthest, second farthest from the, on the right got to Puerto Rico and went south. So, but you see most of the adults, their, their track they take. Next slide. Those are the juveniles. <laughs> these, are, these are teenagers. <laughs> Now, let's go back and flip back. And so I can just sit and go ahead. I can just sit and do this for like a long time watching the, the difference. All right, so leave it on the juveniles here. So we see a number of things. First of all, we see that a lot of them go out over the Atlantic Ocean. That's about, some, for some birds, that's a thousand or 1200 mile trip. They can't stop, as I mentioned. So they're flying nonstop. They fly about 25 miles an hour. So they're flying anywhere from 50 hours, 45 hours to, I think I had one bird that was in the air for 58 hours flying nonstop. We think, wow, that's amazing, but it's not, not so much because there are some other, there's some warblers that fly from the coast of Maine, they fly 3,000 miles to South America without stopping, and they only, they weigh a half an ounce or so. And then there's bar-tailed godwits that migrate from New Zealand 7,000 miles to Alaska nonstop. So that's pretty impressive, but it's not, they're not up there in the record books for, uh, op for non-stop migration. You know, the bird that went way off to the right in that zigzag pattern got blew it, flew into a big storm off, off New York and got disoriented and landed on a ship to rest. And the ship was going in the wrong direction. And he's on, we think, three different ships. Uh, and he, he was on the ships going west, east rather, for seven days. And unfortunately, he didn't make it. Ospreys as we know, need to catch their fish in the, in the top yard or so of the water column. And out in the, the middle of the Atlantic, there just aren't many fish there. So he wasn't able to feed himself, and he died. But he was, when he died, he was closer to Portugal than he was to Rhode Island, where he left America. So then we see a bird that goes up to the north and west. That's the bird on Martha's Vineyard, who made it all the way to Lake Superior, and spent about two months there before she went south. And so we see a couple of things, besides the, the couple of the big differences, obviously the biggest one is all those birds going over the Atlantic. Another sort of slighter, less conspicuous distance difference is that not many of them know about the turn going south here off of Cabo Viata in the middle of Hispaniola. A lot of them go all the way to the end of Hispaniola, to the easternmost part of the Dominican Republic, where they then run out of land, so then they have to go south. So remember those two adults, you go back one. So the two adults that, that, took, that went east, west run or out of Cuba to over to the Yucatan, go ahead, were probably young birds that did this on their first migration. Because as we'll see in the next, go ahead, two, the next one, this one. So here's the adults going north. And you see that um, they like to stay over land as long as they can, so they get funneled to these two peninsulas that are, that are on either side of the Gulf of Venezuela. And from there, they head north and slightly west. Probably the trade winds are blowing them that way a little bit. But they also know what direction they need to take to get to Cuba. And then from Cuba, up to Florida, and up along the coast, and back to their nests. That's a very tightly, uh, a rather tight migration front, meaning these birds are they're in a rush to get home. They're, Birds migrating south are in no rush to get anywhere. There's no pr premium on getting to South America before uh, anybody else. In the spring, there's a big premium on getting back to your nests early because if you don't, someone might take, try to take over your nest. And if you're an old codger and some young whippersnapper arrives in your nest before you get there, you may have a hard time displacing him. So we see that also in the juveniles heading north in the spring in the next slide. And we see the same kind of thing we saw in the fall, where the juveniles don't really know what they're doing. Some of them go out over the water. 
Some of them missed the turn to get up to Florida. So I think in the middle of Cuba, there's a big sign that says, Ospreys turn right for Florida. Well, those two juveniles were texting when they went past that sign. <laughs> they missed the exit. So instead of going 90 miles across the Florida Straits from Cuba to the Keys, those two birds, the bird on the left did 600 miles of open water across the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and then the cool thing about that is that once he got to Alabama, which added a new state for where my ospreys have been, and so that's always fun to sort of keep track of that. Uh, when he got to Alabama, he was 600 miles west of any place he had ever been. And I know every place he's been because he's been wearing a transmitter since he left his nest. And so he's way far west, and he knew that, and he corrected for it. And look, he's going almost two weeks as he's going through the Carolinas. So somehow bird, birds do a lot of, do their navigation, their orientation in a number of ways. They use the obvious, they have a sort of a, a checklist of things they use. And the obvious is landmarks, so if they're close enough to home they can see something they recognize, they use that. They can't use landmarks if you take them out in a, in a van and take your homing pigeons and let them go someplace where they haven't been before. They can use a number of senses. They'll use, the, they have an internal clock so they can use the sun as a compass. They know in the morning that the sun is in the east, and in the afternoon it's in the west. They know, they can sense there's some pigments in their eyes that are called cryptochromes, and they can use those to actually see the Earth's magnetic field. So for an osprey, for a bird, look, the sky in the north and the south looks different than it does in the east and the west. They also, that, that gives them north and, north and south, and that's obviously essential in, in migration and orientation. But what we don't really understand well is how they tell east from west. So how did that bird know that he was too far west? Well, they have another magnetic sense in sensory system that's actually based in their lower bill. And there are, they have crystals of iron called magnetite, which line up in X, Y, Z right angle planes and there are, that they react to the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field from one place to the other is very different, can be very different. So there are songbirds in Europe and the Netherlands that are genetically programmed to recognize the Earth's magnetic field in Spain. And when they sense that, they take, they've been going from the Netherlands southwest to Spain. When they get to Spain, if they kept going in that direction, they die over the Atlantic. So they have to turn right there. And they know to turn right because the magnetic field of Spain triggers something in their brain that says, oh, time to go southeast instead of southwest. So somehow that bird has sensed, we think that they do that as they're wandering around exploring the world, as they leave their nest, they go this way, and this feels like something in that little sensory organ or system they have in their beak. If they go this way, it feels different, and so they're recording that. And they're also memorizing magnetic signposts. So those birds um, that got to far to Cuba, the adults, we go back one. So the adults all know when it's time to turn north to get to Cuba. And that's something that they're, that they're learning as they make their repeated migrations. Each time they make a migration, they learn more about the route. Next slide. Next one. So this is cool. This is Bell, my favorite osprey. This is a juvenile we tagged in 2010, and she just made her third trip back to the Martha's Vineyard where she was born. We hope this is the year that she'll find a mate and nest. So she was the most extreme of the Atlantic crossers. She was only about 200 miles from Bermuda. And we actually knew that um, some ospreys do this because there are records, of, a couple of records of ospreys on Bermuda. So we know that ospreys do that to some extent. But we didn't know before is that it's only the juvenile. So I now know that any osprey that's on Bermuda is a juvenile, or was a juvenile. So Belle makes a play out of the Atlantic. She gets into the Bahamas, flies her way down to Hispaniola, goes across, and she went way down south to the very southern limit of the Amazonian rainforest in Brazil. So then she comes north, and um, you see her um, first trip north is 2012, which is this one. So she got here to Hispaniola and she, did, she didn't, this was the way, she was just going to repeat her path from the first trip, that's where she would have gone. But she gets here and she sees the Bahamas and so she sort of island hops up through the Bahamas and she finds Florida, goes up the coast, 
gets back home and finds her parents and says, why didn't you tell me I didn't have to fly over a thousand miles of the Atlantic to get to South America? So she now knows that she doesn't have to do that Atlantic thing again. So in 2012, in the fall of 2012, when she's coming south, she goes down the coast and she went out over the Bahamas again. Um, no, she's the, sorry, this is the 2012 track. So she took off and she didn't know that she would get to Florida. She hasn't been there yet. So she comes down, does the same thing, gets better. She comes back in 2013. She's done a little better. She gets to Cuba, comes up here, and she turns a little early, so she went across more water than she had to. But now she sort of got a sense of it. She comes back down in 2013, and she's getting closer to the adult track. 2014, she's finally figured it out. She comes back in following the, the path that all of the adults do. So it's really cool to see this one bird, how she learns the migration, migratory route, more or, more or less by trial and error, and by following the, the simple rules of go south in the, in the fall and stay over land if you can. If you can't, just go over water. And in the spring, go north and stay over land. And following those, that little paradigm or algorithm that you eventually, after a couple of years of migrating north and south, they discover this, the safest route. It's not the shortest route, but it's the safest route. Next. So the juveniles, the juveniles come home. How do they find their way around? The next slide. Remember, the males typically nest close to home. So this is a male coming back. Snowy is a male ta we tagged in juvenile as a youngster in 2011. And he went down to, to, in his first year, he went to Venezuela, spent 18 months down there. The juveniles, when they go down in the fall, in their first fall, the next spring when all of the adults are coming home, the juveniles stay down for an extra year. They do a gap year down. So they, they do 18 months down south. They're not going to breed till they're two or three years old anyway. So that they all got together one spring and, and said, who wants to go 3,000 miles north to do nothing? And nobody raised their wings, so they said, okay, we'll all stay here. <laughs> so that's a little bit facetious, but evolutionarily, that's what happened. Migration, as we'll see, is a very dangerous business, and there's no reason to risk a, a full migration cycle of six to seven or 8,000 miles if you're not going to do anything. And they're not going to breed till they're two or three or four anyway. So they missed that first migration north. So here is Snowy, who came back from Venezuela in 2013, in the spring, and he did go up to Boston, um, yinged around a little bit just south of Boston, but then he went back to his home in Martha's Vineyard and sort of commuted back and forth between, Bo between Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. The next slide shows Penelope, a female who was tagged in 2008, and this, so this is her first trip north after her 18 months down in South America. She got almost home to here, and then turned around and went up into Massachusetts, and she came up into New Hampshire. Finally, on the 24th of July, sort of out of the blue, she left New Hampshire and spent two days and went straight back to Martha's Vineyard. She went right back to her nest. I think it was her high school reunion. She must have gotten a little notice in the mail. So she went back for about two or three days and went back to the pond where she learned how to fish, and then turned around and went back up to New Hampshire, and she was back and forth between a couple of ponds in New Hampshire, and we're pretty sure, had she survived her next migration cycle, which she didn't, um, that she would have gone up there, and that's where she would have nested. Next. There's a bird that had a little bit of navigational issues. <laughs> so he arrived, uh, this is a buck who was tagged in 2009 in South Carolina, the yellow path is his track as he left in the, fall, in the late summer, early, early fall of 2009. Then in 2011, he's coming back. He found the coast of North Carolina on the 26th of April. He was only about 150 miles east of his nest, and he missed the turn, big time. So it, that track follows all of his movement between April 26th and August 13th when he finally got home. I I figured every place he spent the night, and I calculated the distance from roost to roost. He flew 8,413 miles roost to roost before finding his nest. And his migration, his whole migration back from South America, I think was like 2,500 miles. So he had a serious trouble. Next slide. He crossed the Pennsylvania border 11 times. 
Uh, I think my, I, this is total speculation, but it seems to me that there was something that confused his magnetic receptors about Vir in Virginia and North Carolina. I thought that little end run on the 2nd of July that he made through western Pennsylvania might, got him, might have gotten him around the problem, but that wasn't his last trip south. He, he got confused, made it north, and he eventually made it back to home, but it took him 8,400 miles and about three months to do it. Next. So how about juvenile mortality? There's very high mortality in all wildlife in that the first year is a tough one. That's when the natural selection sort of sorts out the wheat from the chaff. And so we have to, if you've survived that first year, you've been through all the things that are going to happen to you. You've learned how to hunt. I say that you've learned how to fly. Well, that's the easy part. It turns out that landing is the hard part. I've watched a number of ospreys make their first flight. And when they do that, it, it's amazing. It looks like they've been flying forever. And then you see them make their first landing, and you go, oh. Maybe <laughs> that's the hard part. We lost the bird in New Hampshire the, a couple of days after he left, left his nest because he missed the landing on a big high power line, uh, tower, and sort of parachuted down into some thick brush and couldn't get back up out of it and a coyote or something got him that night. So this is when natural selection sorts out the, the birds that are in the shallow end of the gene pool from the ones that aren't. And there's a pretty high mortality rate. So our, in, for our satellite tag birds, it's about 71%. This is data through 2011. And it turns out that it's not mostly during migration. A lot of the birds make it through the southbound migration. And then we see a lot of mortality when they're on the wintering grounds. Uh, next. So these, it's hard to tell the colors apart, but there's the, uh, if you're up close, the, the oranger little balloons with an M on them are birds that were lost while they were migrating. See, we only lost four birds that before they migrated, the little blue circles up top. And the redder balloons, if you can distinguish, with W's if you're the front. And those are birds that actually settled down to winter. And we lose a lot of those birds. In the next slide, we see where do we lose, where's the mortality, what percent, of all the birds we've lost, this is a percentage. Of all the birds we've lost during in adults and juveniles, at which stage in the annual cycle do we lose them? And you see the, the big, the glaring difference there in the adults is go, it's the migration going south, very little mortality going north, and you see that mortality for the adults is very low in the winter, and it's quite high for the juveniles. So what's that all about next? Well, this is why there's that high mortality going south in the in the migration going south. Unfortunately for ospreys, their southbound migration co corresponds exactly with the hurricane season. So a lot of those birds that we lost going south were lost over water because they flew into a hurricane and couldn't get out of it. Next. So how about the juvenile? What's, what's the deal with those, that high mortality of the juveniles? This is one of the juveniles from the Delaware bird. And the area that he's covered during his winter now, it's 18 months down in South America, it's 450 square miles. In the next slide, we see an adult from Nantucket, Senior Bones, who spent his whole five months in South America in an area of only six square miles. So the deal about the adults is that they're going back to a place that's safe. And we know it's safe because they've survived previous winters there, and they're hardly moving at all. We had one bird that spent five months in an area of a quarter square mile. He found some big lake that was, or some small lake, that was chocker block full of fish. And I was worried about him when it was time for him to migrate north because I thought he hadn't exercised all winter and he was going to be out of shape. <laughs> but he made it. Um, but that's the deal. The adults are finding a spot that's safe and they're staying there for five months and then they go north. Uh, the juveniles find a spot they like and they're just like teenagers with their first driver's license. They go on big road trips. They're looking for a better place. They found one spot, and who knows if that's going to be a really good one. So for the first three or four months while they're down there, they do a lot of wandering. Next. So I'm going to take over the controls here. So I have a website where you can look at follow these ospreys. Um, it's called Osprey Tracks. Pretty easy to remember.
So we, you can set up races. So when you get to the map, you can zoom in. And see exactly what sort of what the habitat was. So this, this bird, this is a um, bird from Washington, D.C. That was his five months in South America. Just spent it all on this one little oxbow lake down in the Amazon. Very safe spot. This is Bell. So the fun thing about this is you can take one bird and move it along its path. Right, we're going we're gonna to start with... So the yellow bird, this bird is going back to New Hampshire. So a yellow bird is done and is going back to New Hampshire. He gets the first start. And all of the other birds, their dots will move as they get where he is. So now you're going to see Bell starts to move. Bell has about 4,600 miles to go to get back to Martha's Vineyard. So she's moving next. And now all of a sudden, Ron, with the green guy, is on his way. Bell is past, Bell is out over the, uh, she's down in Haiti. The purple guy is the neighbor of the green guy. The green guy, Ron, these two birds nest on either side of the South Capitol Street Bridge over the Anacostia River, about 200 yards from the, Nat, from the Nats baseball stadium in Washington, D.C. So, so what, so Ron is already in, in Haiti, and Rodney, now Rodney, the purple dot, is starting to move, and he does a little end run and catches up with, almost catches up with everybody. Snowy, the orange dot here, is a Martha's Vineyard bird. So let's let's get Donovan up closer and closer to home. So Donovan was the first one back to New, Ham New Hampshire. Snowy hasn't even started to move yet. But Snowy does, uh, Snowy, the interesting, one of the cool things about Snowy is on, her, on Snowy's first migration, he spent his winter in Venezuela. On his way north, on his first trip north, he found this great spot in Cuba. That's just a real fishy osprey heaven spot. On his second trip south, we, we completely expected him to go all the way to Venezuela, back to where he'd spent his first 18 months down south. Well, he got to that spot in Cuba. And he bang, actually had to backtrack to get to it and spend his five months there. So, pretty smart cookie. He skipped the whole Caribbean thing. So if we follow Bell, see that everybody that's a traffic jam here in Cuba. Bell and... Bell is heading to Martha's Vineyard. The green dot Ron is heading to... This is like the, at the stadium when you're betting on things that are going around the on, move. So this was really interesting. Bell and, and Ron, the green dot, were moving almost the exact same distance every day. They started at the same time. They finished about the same distance. And here, they probably saw each other. They were two miles apart right here, and then their paths crossed about 10 minutes later. So it's likely that, they, that these two birds I tagged, one on Martin's Vineyard and one in DC, actually bumped into each other. So here comes Ron, got back to DC a month before, a day before his neighbor. And then Finally, in just a couple of days ago, on April 10th to the 12th, my last four birds got home. So this is this map is automatically updated. So if you go to the website, it's just in fact it's just updating itself now. So all of the data from the transmitters automatically goes to a, to a database over in Germany, and they wrote the code for the website that lets that automatic the website automatically goes over to the database in Germany and updates where all the birds are. So, um, and if you, if you go to the website, if you click on this, you can subscribe. And I send out e email updates every once in a while. When the birds are doing interesting things, I just send out a little email blurb to 
900 or so people who have signed up. Okay, so now we're going back. Sam's going to take over the control again. How many birds are you tracking at one time? Right now we have, um, I think I have 13. I've got one young bird who's down in, in Brazil, and then um, 12 other birds that are, that are all back now, either on their nest or close to, or in the area where we think they're going to breed. Uh, so the latest um, upgrade in the technology, most of the data we've looked at has been uh, data that's come to us via satellite. So the transmitters have a little GPS unit in them, and every hour, for 12 hours a day, the GPS unit records where it is, how high the bird is, what direction it's flying, and how fast it's flying. Stores up that information for three days, and then every three days it dumps it up to the satellite, and the satellite is 540 miles over that little one ounce transmitter. So amazingly enough, that little transmitter sends a signal 540 miles that has all that information in it. And that's a hard thing for the radio to do. So it can't send a lot of information. So we only get those, we get every three days, we get 36 data points for where the bird was. We're now using transmitters that talk to us via cell towers. And those, the radio only has to send a signal about 10 miles or 15 miles. And so we get a ton of data. If you measure data, it would be tons. Uh, we have one bird now that I think I have 80,000 data points for. We, can get, we get data every day from the birds if they're near a cell tower. And when we get the data, sometimes it is minute by minute locations of where that bird was. So now we can find really cool, we can answer really neat questions about what's the home range, how far are the birds going from their nest, and um, how are there seasonal changes in where they're hunting? And individual differences in where they're hunting. So next shot. So these are two birds tagged on Martha's Vineyard uh, last summer. Icarius uh, right on the south shore and then DJ over on Tapaquitic in the east. Uh, DJ's orange and Icarius is red. And you can see here they're both spending a lot of time hunting in that big cloud of points just north of Icarius' nest. There's a herring run in that great pond. So all of the ospreys we had tagged, not just these two, we're going there. It was the all-you-can-eat smorgasbord for about two weeks. Next. So a month later, Icarius is still hunting up there in the Tisbury Great Pond. He's also hunting offshore more than he had before. DJ is no longer coming over to that. It's not, the herring aren't running, so it's not worth DJ's time to go all the way over to West Tisbury Great Pond. Next. So now, obviously something you probably blue fish are running off the, you know, baby blues are running off the south beach. Uh, Icarius is hunting a lot offshore. He's going up about a mile, at least a mile offshore. And Icarius is hanging all around Katama Bay and Chappaquiddick next. Now, here we are in, in the first week in August, and there are some fish running over off the Menemsha shore in Vineyard Sound. And DJ doesn't know about them, so he isn't going over there. Next. So on the right, we see the data we get from satellites. And so those are, each of those little balloons is where that bird was at, at one hour intervals. And so we connect each of those little balloons with a straight line. So we sort of assume the birds were taking a straight line between those points. But if you look on the left, there's a bunch of birds that are going to Florida um, in, the, in the almost exactly the same section of Florida. And you see how squiggly those lines are. So now what's the next slide look like? Okay, go back one. All right, so I'm taking over again. So this, this is really cool. So we can now follow our birds. So those little dots are shows how high above the land the bird was. The orange track is where the bird was, was looking straight down. So now you'll see the bird is coasting down, coasting down, and then he goes shooting up, and he's going up as a thermal. So a lot of when birds, are, when large birds of prey migrate during the daytime because they like to use thermal. So he found some hot air there, and he went straight up.
So this is this is that same track. So those are five minutes. That's five minutes. So we saw him coasting down. He found a thermal. He went up 2,110 feet in five minutes, and then coasted on down to the next thermal. So when birds are prey and migrate during the day because they love to use these thermals, this is you can take over again, Sam. <laughs> it's yours for the rest of the for the duration. So. Um, Birds will find a thermal, and that's hot air rising, just like glider pilots um, use. And they'll get in a thermal, and it's like it's an elevator. They just take it up, and when they get up high enough, they'll glide out of that thermal, and they'll coast down and look for another one. In the fall, when if there's a heavy migration or an area where there's a concentration of birds, they can actually just look for another bunch of birds that are going up in a thermal. So somehow they either see or sense the thermals, and they go. Take a ride up, they glide down, they take a ride up, and I glide down, they can fly for miles and miles without flapping their wings. It's a really almost effortless way to migrate. Next. So they'll even do the same sort of thing over the ocean. There aren't necessarily thermals, but these are uh, six birds that are going across the Caribbean in the, uh, last fall. And you see that those lines are all squiggly, especially the black one right in the middle. If we go to the next slide, we'll see what he's doing. So he's doing what's called dynamic soaring. So the wind is out of the west, and you see him gliding down, and then each of those spots is about a minute apart. So you see he's going pretty fast, and then when he takes that turn to the right, he's climbing, he's going, he goes up uh, 200 meters, so that's 600 feet. He climbs up into the wind, notice that the dots are closer together, so he's going more slowly. And then he gets up, he climbs up, so he goes into the wind and climbs up and then turns and glides down and goes into the wind and turns and glides and goes down. So that's dynamic, called dynamic soaring. And it's an energy efficient way to get across um, large bodies of water when there, is, uh, when there aren't really, really good thermals going up that they can ride. Next. So we can actually, this is cool. This is one of the same birds. This is Icarus that we saw feeding, feeding up on the vineyard. I remember he was going out over the ocean. So here comes Icarus. Coming along, this is you know, the Guiana coast in, in eastern South America. We see him come out to the shore, and he goes out over the water, and he's poking along, poking along, and we, he caught a fish here. Because he goes straight back to the beach, and he lands on a, little, on a tree, and he spends 45 minutes eating that fish, and then he takes off again on migration. So we can actually tell when these birds are catching a fish when they're migrating from, three, they were 3,000 miles away, and we can keep such a close watch on them as they migrate that we can see that when they actually catch the fish. Next. Okay, so that's the end of the serious stuff. There are a couple of funny slides. So here's a very efficient male. This is in the spring. This, this spring, someone took this picture. So he is both building and bringing nesting material to his nest and a fish for mom. So very efficient. Next one. This is a full house. This is on Martha's Vineyard. Ospreys almost always lay three eggs, and usually all three hatch, and if, depending on how abundant fit the fish supply is around that, the nest, three young may fledge, but it's much more typical for about, the average is about one and a half, one to one and a half young surviving per nest. This was a, a very overachieving pair that raised four young, and all four young and the two adults are in the nest in this picture. There's about 20 pounds of ospreys in that nest. Next. And finally, <laughs> there's, a, there's a fisherman somewhere who has probably told the story a thousand times about the day he was reeling a fish in, and there was a big splash. He almost had it in, and there was a big splash, and he was so surprised he dropped his rod, and he watched his rod fly away behind an osprey. <laughs> He took his fish and his rod back to his nest. <laughs> so next. So the, the, the project has been funded by lots of different people, a lot of anonymous donors. People, I funded a lot of this research by answering the phone where I, the word got around about, about my studies and people were so interested that they called up and said, hey, I want to, do an os I want to tag an osprey uh, at our place in New Hampshire. Uh, I've got a study in New Hampshire that was the, uh, Ian McLeod, who's the head of the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center in, in near that Squam Lake, uh, called me up or emailed and said, I'd like to do a transmitter. I'd like to do some transmitters. He found the money, and I, I had the expertise to do the trapping and the tagging. And so lots of people have helped with this. 
Once again, if you're interested in keeping track of these birds, ospreytracks.com um, is the site to go. The next one, this was osprey tagging in the Stone Age. This was back in 1972, the second year I banded ospreys. Um, it's me on the left, not the right. <laughs> and then you go back a couple. Though. So we'll leave that one on, on the screen while I answer your questions. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for helping out the Land Conservancy. I know you're all going to dig, dig deep and make a generous contribution to save that land so that um, I understand there's an osprey um, hawk migration watch site up there. Um, so this would be, be doing a good thing helping to protect that land. selection. And given what you said about the bird in Cuba, these things seem to be reasonably opportunistic. Is, do you have any tighter feeling than that about how they end up selecting the wintering ground to which they return so faithfully each year? You've seen that happen with the juveniles. And that's, um, prior to my work, almost no one had tagged juvenile aspirants. And that's for two reasons. First, the, the transmitters cost about $4,000, and then uh, we knew, everybody knows that there's this very high mortality in the juveniles, so very few people had wanted to risk $4,000 on a bird that might die in the bay a month after it started to fly. So, and at that time, early in, early in the, the history of osprey tracking, we didn't know anything about the adults, so the smart money all went to tag good adults that have a much higher survivorship. The survivorship rate in Adults is probably 80% rather than the 20% we see in juveniles. So very few people had tagged juveniles, and so when I started doing it, which was actually more or less by accident, but it turned out to be a great, very interesting avenue of research, once we started seeing the, the juveniles go down, I had thought for a long time that that extra year that they spend down south might have helped them find a really good fishing spot. So I sort of expected that the juveniles would wander around for a lot of that 18 months that they spent down south. Well, they don't. They're almost all settled down. They've picked a spot within about four or five months of arriving in South America. And so they'll, they'll, they'll go, and how they know when to stop is a, mis is, is a real mystery, because we know the, the adults know, because they're going back to a spot they've chosen before. But how does a juvenile osprey know when it's time to stop migrating and start looking for a winter, winter home? It's not timing, because they, when they go south, they can stop for a month. We've had birds stop in, in Florida for a month, and I was sure that they were gonna, that was their, gonna be their winter spot. And all of a sudden, this, the migration switch goes on again, and they, they migrate another. We had one bird who stopped in Miami. I thought for sure that was where he was gonna spend his winter, and he flipped the switch, and he wound up all the way down on the Amazon. So there's something that tells them where they're supposed to stop migrating. And I just had the idea the other day that maybe it's something to do with latitude. They, they somehow sense latitude. Because females tend to go further south than males. And regardless of where they, where they started, they tend to go further south. Um, so something tells them it's time to stop migrating. And then they just they find a good spot. And they'll stay there, and then they'll go on big road trips. They'll go on a thousand kilometer loops out over exploring the countryside, and very often they'll come back to the spot they started, and they'll often come back from a very different direction. They'll go east, then south, then west, then north, and they'll come back to the spot they, where they've been for a while. And then they'll maybe try that in another direction, and occasionally they'll shift their base of operations some, and by usually by January of their first trip south, um, they've chosen a spot, and it's, it certainly has to do with just how many fish they're catching per day. And once it's, they've been down for about four or five months, they've, they've almost all made the decision. I've had one bird uh, who spent his whole 18 months down south moving back and forth across northern Venezuela from between about five different reservoirs and lakes that was, um, he covered a really wide area. But, and some of the birds that will land on a big river will often shift up and down the river as, because down there there's big differences in river height as the rainy season and dry season 
cycle progresses. So that those differences will change, obviously change the fishing situation for birds so they can shift up and down rivers. But the ones that find a little oxbow lake somewhere where everything's going to be the same all winter, um, just find a spot. So it's something to do with their, they find the, the ponds are fishier here than they're anywhere else they find and they just choose that spot. Go and travel together, and they, do they mate to the same mates? Yes. Well, they mate to. They really, we say that ospreys um, mate for life. They really mate to a, a nest site for life. They go off on separate vacations. That's just why they can mate for life. Um, female, <laughs> female. I have to throw that. I always throw that one. Out. He usually gets a jump. I, I didn't throw out the one that that bird that wandered all around the blue track and went everywhere. That was clearly a male because he was to a. Embarrassed to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that line. I always throw that one out. Anyway, so they go off on separate vacations. Males leave in, in females leave in mid-August. Um, the males and the juveniles leave in early September usually, and they all go on their own. So they um, they do travel pretty much independently, and they'll come back to the same nest. And when they come back to the same nest, if they the males typically get back first, but not always. So whoever gets back first will claim that nest. And if somebody, some young whippersnapper is trying to claim the nest, usually the bird that owns that nest, no, the home court advantage is big in birds. So if you're coming back to your territory um, and you're gonna come in very aggressively if anyone else is on your nest. And if you're a usurper, you may see some big old adult osprey come barreling in on you, meaning business, and you go, okay, I was just kidding, I'll see ya. Um, so they will shuffle on the way, and then if the other pair, or part of the pair gets back, they both get back, they know each other, they've been through this courtship stuff, they can get down to laying eggs in no time flat. If one of them dies, they, won't, they don't mate for life in the sense that if a mate dies, they won't replace it. So they'll replace it as soon as they can. I had one, we were trying to catch a, a, a male at one nest, and we, very often you catch the female first, and if we catch the female first, put a hood on her and just hold her for a while and hope that the male will go back to the nest. With this one male we were trying to crap, wouldn't go to the nest, and he had a clump of seaweed that he was going to put in, trim up in the, in the nest. And after about 45 minutes of her, the female not being around, he went up and started doing courtship displays. And he was already like, I said, man, you're in trouble when I let her go. <laughs> so they're very quick to replace mates. Often there can be, uh, if we, in the case where you have a widow, Arrive, returning to its nest, often there'll be such a fight between the other sex to fill the gap that that year they may not even nest. We had that happen in New Hampshire last year where at Ayers Lake, Ayers Rock Dam, the uh, male didn't come back. Female came back from previous years. The male didn't, and there were three males that were trying to take over, fill that vacancy. They weren't putting any sticks on the nest, which was just a plywood platform. And they were, they were all calculating with the female. She was laying eggs. The males were kicking the eggs out of the nest because each one of them thought it was probably somebody else's egg. <laughs> and they, they didn't, want it, didn't want that egg in the nest. And they, that was such a mess in soap opera all spring that they never raise any young. So, um, so they, they, they come back to the same spot if they both come back. Um, so we have osprey nests on Martha's Vineyard that have been occupied for 25 years or more. And some of those have probably been through five or six replacements of individuals. It looks like it's the same pair, but it isn't. So. Do we know how a bird knows its way to the same place in South America? Or back to its own nest? Do you know what it, well, some, there, it's, it's some combination. When they get really close, they're using landmarks. But it's something about that. They're memorizing a magnet, the Earth's magnetic field. So as they get close to their nest or, or their wintering grounds, they're using some combination of some magnetic sense of this is the way my little magneto receptor in my beak feels when I'm getting close to my winter spot. And if I go this way, then it feels a little different. And if I go this way, that's, yeah, that feels right. So, they, so they're somehow using that. When they get real close, they'll use landmarks. Um, but it's something about some magnetic sense that seems to be the real cue. Some raptors uh, migrate in flocks. Right. And obviously, the osprey does not seem to. 
sometimes they do, but not, not big flocks. So occasionally be a small flock, and it's almost more coincidental than, um, than actively flying together. You know, they may be going through an area where there are a lot of thermals, so you'll see a bunch of ospreys, but they're not like broad wings that fly in yeah, big so flocks. What might be the evolutionary benefit of one versus the other? It may have something to do with um, Broad wings, are, broad wings are sort of the classic example of, of, a, of a raptor, a triraptor, that migrates in, in flocks. And it's probably some relate, probably due to some combination of there being so many broad wings. It's probably, short of turkey vultures, they're probably the most abundant raptor in North America. And we don't see them very much because they're, far, they're pretty much of a forest hawk. They don't, they're not as conspicuous as red tails. So it may be some combination of sheer numbers, of, there are a lot of them around, and they're really reliant on thermals. And so being in a, in a flock um, will help you with thermals, because as soon as somebody finds a thermal, then everybody sort of goes over to that, goes over to that thermal and rises up. And that's why at Hawk Counts you can see 5,000 broad wings in a day. Um, when you have a, a pair, and most of the winters, one arrives first, how long will Give up on the, the other uh, Probably, the, the, as soon as they get back, they'll start. The male, males will start displaying. As soon as if the male gets back first, he'll just start displaying. He's not going to wait for the wife to come home. No, he'll just start displaying because he can't. He doesn't know if she's going to come. Right. He can't count on her coming home. So he's going to start to display as soon as he gets home. And then, if a new female comes in, that if a, another female gets there before his mate from last year, he he may go through courtship with her, and then if the next day her, the, the regular female, the real owner of that nest comes in, then she's likely to chase off the young hussy and she'll have a little bit of explaining to do, but not too much. <laughs> How do you get up on the nests? Um, ladders, sometimes climbing spurs, uh, sometimes bucket trucks. Platform is out wide, and so. I put the ladder, so we put the ladder on right on the edge of the platform. That one looks a little tall. Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, that, that nest, I don't know where that, frankly, I don't know where that nest is. Someday I'm going to show this picture, and someone's going to say, hey, I took that picture. And I stole this off the internet. I should put a little announcement on the bottom. I, I try to give credit. Well, I know when someone took a picture of it, credit it. That's, that was taken by the internet. <laughs> so I don't know where that nest is. But, but that nest, if, if the ladder would reach it, I would just put the ladder up against, not where the perch is, but up against the side of the platform. Or I'd get someone with a bucket truck to take me up. We did a nest in New Hampshire last year that was really tall. And the guy, this is the bucket truck affair, the guy said, yeah, I think my bucket can get up there. And it was, I think it was a 60 foot pole. And yes, it turned out to be a 60 foot pole because I think his bucket got to 55. <laughs> so we waited and it was perfect. When we're going to catch the males, we wait until the males come in with the fish and they will give the fish to the female. They always eat the head first, that's their overhead, their carrying charge. And they, so they give the rest of the fish to the female and she'll take it off somewhere to feed. And then the male will usually take over incubation while the female's off feeding. So that's when we go in and put our noose carpet over the, the noose trap over the eggs. And so we were all set and I was going up and the nest was so high that the male didn't even see me coming. But he's up in the nest and I was getting closer and closer. I go, now we're not going to make it. I could almost reach the edge of the nest, but we couldn't do it. So, yeah. um, so that's how we get there. Ladders and coal, well, yeah. I wanted to let you know that I've actually met the birds that nest on the South African Street Bridge on Canada. Oh, did you? Yeah, we used to go there. Okay. And we would pass the birds and we would walk in. Well, getting grand vocal people be quiet is another story, but we pass and see the birds, you know, nesting in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Ron and Rodney are those birds. I want to say thank you very much. You're welcome. And I invite everybody to have cookies, lots and lots of cookies. Yeah. And we also would like to have you have a Putney Mountain hat. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I hope that the bird doesn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank out. you. Thank you.